In 2011, life was pretty good. I, we'd made our tree change to Tasmania. We'd started building our dream home. We'd found and adopted our lovely crazy puppy, Lily. Relationships with my family were good. I'd landed a great job and we were making new friends down here. But I was left with that nagging feeling, a feeling that something was missing, that I wasn't living up to my potential, that I wasn't doing that thing I should be doing. The problem was I didn't know what that thing was that I needed to do to make me feel whole. I was approaching 39 and I decided it was time to do something about this lack of insight. So I could start my 40s knowing who I was and how I should contribute to the world. But how to do it? It's not like I'd never tried to work this out before with no success. I decided that this needed to be something different, something radical, something where I was totally immersed. So I created my own self-development project based on TED Talks, as you do. After all, there were talks on everything that I wanted to cover and then some. Using TED Talks as the source of inspiration would not only help me in addressing this lack of fulfillment, but it would also help me address another nagging feeling. You see, I'd been watching TED Talks for years. I'd been watching these amazing, inspirational and insightful speakers, and I'd never done anything with them. I'm pretty sure you all know exactly what I'm talking about. I'd been hoarding this inspiration in my head and in my heart, and I decided it was time to do something with it. So after months of watching and re-watching TED Talks, of selecting topics and scheduling activities, on the 1st of November 2011, I started my year of TED to find my authentic self, to address some of those broken parts of myself, to implement the wisdom of TED Talks in my life and to share the experience through writing a blog. The blog had a couple of purposes. The first was that I'd always wanted to write and this would give me a great topic to do that. The other reason was that I wanted to share my experiences as a way of connecting with others, honouring another part of the TED inspiration. You see, I think that there's been a massive shift in the way that we represent ourselves in the world these days and the honesty that we approach the world with. People are far more willing to admit their imperfections and there seems to be this movement to lift the collective veil off our eyes so that we can understand that we are never truly alone. And I think that TED has been a massive part of this shift. Although it has been criticised as being chicken soup for the soul, among other things, I think that it's a lot more than this. I've watched so many talks of courageous and inspirational sharing, like Becky Blanton talking about the year that she was homeless and the invisibility that she experienced during that time. And J.D. Schramm advocating for better services for people recovering from suicide attempts after his failed suicide attempt. And then, of course, there are the validation talks, like Susan Cain's The Power of Introverts, that helped me understand that I wasn't some weird loner, which I'd sometimes suspected. And there are hundreds of other talks, and what they do is they help us understand that amazing people who are successful are also weird, quirky, and broken in their own ways. And some of those ways are like us, we're not alone. And I wanted to contribute to that growing resource. I wanted to be free to share those parts of myself that I thought were somehow wrong, to practice in Brene Brown's words, excruciating vulnerability. So the blog was helping me potentially inspire and support other people in the process. The blog and the fact that I shared the project with family and friends also gave me another, I guess, subconscious purpose. <laughs> and that was accountability. Um, I couldn't quit when things got difficult, and trust me, they got difficult really quickly, because I was publicly accountable and accountable to my friends and family. And being the shocking perfectionist that I was, failure was not an option. Which is probably a really good thing because I think I probably would have quit if it hadn't have been for that accountability. So what was my year of TED? What did it look like? It was a project of total immersion. I would undertake 23 30-day activities, starting one on the first of the month, another one on the 15th of the month, with a rolling schedule through the year. All of the activities would be based on at least one TED talk, but many were based on more than one talk. And that's pretty much the premise. It's not a complex concept, might have been a crazy one, and in but in hindsight, I really wouldn't change a thing. 
even though I did refer to it as being potentially ill-conceived at the beginning. I should mention that I only managed to complete 21 activities. That's because after activity 12, I really felt the need to have a brief break to regroup and prepare for what was coming. And also later in the project, I became really busy with work and there were two really important activities I felt the need to extend. So the activities were broad ranging from external through to chipping away at the very core of who I was as a person. And they can be grouped into five general categories, although they do cross over a little bit. Just before we go into that though, I will mention the artwork that you'll see in the slides was a really fantastic part of my year of TED. It was all done by my exceptionally talented brother, Matthew, and working with him on these pieces was just a really sp special part of the project for me. So the first group of activities, these were the simple ones. The things I thought would just be interesting to try on. They weren't particularly challenging, but they all gave me something that I carry on in my life. Things like controlling my soundscape for my own well-being and maintaining a weekday vegetarian diet. The second group was about trying to help me be a happier person. These activities had exercises to either remove stress or help me focus on being happy. So living the three A's, for example, based on Neil Pazreach's talk, The Three A's of Awesome, um, was about maintaining an awareness of the wondrous things in our first world, having a more positive attitude and trying to be more authentic. And the other activities had things like stopping multitasking to be more in the moment, which is a great stress reliever and I highly recommend it. Um, journaling daily gratitudes and through Brene Brown's work on vulnerability and shame and wholeheartedness, learning how to be self-compassionate. This was extremely difficult because it was a skill that I was severely lacking in my life. You see, we all have an internal critic. It's just that some of ours are louder and nastier than others. This was my chance to quiet mine down a little bit and counter her with an internal champion. And I'll be forever grateful I was able to do that, quiet her down a little bit. These activities not only gave me skills to carry on in my life, but they were often the saviours during my year of TED as well. They gave me moments of reprieve and the ability to recharge my batteries for what was to come. The next group of activities were about being brave. Well, the whole project was about being brave, but these two activities were about really pushing me outside my comfort zone. The first of these was activity one, 30 days of fashion, based on Jesse Arrington's talk, Wearing Nothing New. The general idea was to introduce more colour into my wardrobe and to wear things that I just wouldn't normally wear, all of which were acquired through op shopping. And yes, this is one of my secondhand treasures. This is where that potentially ill-conceived statement comes back. Why I felt I could deal with this straight up, I still have no idea. You see, I knew I used my clothes to hide and to blend in, and suddenly I made myself colourful and I made myself stand out and, well, it did allow me to have the first major meltdown of the project on day two. <laughs> and that did prepare me for some of the doubts, fears and feelings of exposure that were to come. So I guess it may not have been that ill-conceived. The second activity was starting a movement, um, which was always going to be difficult because I'm just not that sort of person. The movement I, saw, I chose to start was challenge your preconceptions. The concept was for people to pick a stereotype that they had and to find out the rest of the story. So possibly too big a topic for starters, but this is the only activity I place in the failure category, which may not be entirely fair because the challenge itself was to go through the process of stepping outside my introverted nature to try to start a movement, not necessarily getting the movement started. However, given that the blog that was set up to support this only received 37 page views in the challenge month. And there was no interaction. I think we can all agree I could have done better. <laughs> the fourth group of activities were about helping me be a better person and trying to connect more with others. You know how there are those things about yourself that you know and you just don't think about? And so you end up relearning them again and again in your life. Through this group of activities, I relearned the fact that I hid myself from people and not just in my clothes. 
There are so many people in my life I've never thanked, I've never fully appreciated, and I've never told them how special they are or were to me. I was always scared of somehow getting it wrong, or being laughed at, or being rejected. As a result, I've allowed so many wonderful friends to slip away from my life for fear of telling them how I really felt. It's probably the reason why writing heartfelt handwritten letters to important people in my life during 30 days of letters was more difficult than I'd ever imagined it was going to be. But it was a very worthwhile process. I highly recommend it and it does very <laughs> help you connect more with others. The main part of this group though was to be more compassionate and be less judgmental of others. Probably something that many people in this world could focus on doing. I knew this was something I could improve upon. I didn't realise just how large that room for improvement was until I started doing these activities. But it is something that I have worked on. It's something I'm better at, but it's also something I'd maintain a focus in in my life. These were really lovely activities to do and they did help me grow and open up to other people. The last group were the main part of the project. These ones were about helping me find my authentic self and how I should be contributing to the world. Through this group of activities, I've been able to define my purpose, cause and belief, which is a wonderful thing to finally understand. I've developed a greater appreciation for my leadership style and for the strength in that style. And through developing success statements, I've been able to gain some control over comparing myself to others. Some control. Analyzing all of my choices in 30 days of choice was actually a really interesting activity to undertake. Until I started doing 30 days of being wrong alongside it. And then it rapidly descended into analyzing all the poor decisions in my life and my regrets. This was difficult and somewhat detrimental to my mental health but I have been able to work out from this that the worst decisions of my life, my biggest regrets, were the decisions I never made. They were the ones that I was passive about, that I let life or other people make for me. And that's a very powerful thing to learn and understand about yourself. And then there was time, which was a complete revelation for me. I was fascinated with the concept of a time perspective when I first watched Philip Zimbardo's talk. I knew mine would be past negative even before I did the test and I wasn't wrong. But this activity helped me understand one of the main reasons for that. And that's the internal Kylie. The Kylie, the way I view myself in the world, being the scared, lonely, bullied and powerless 15 year old girl I once was. That's been a really difficult thing to shift. I'm trying to make that internal Kylie the woman that I am now, but it's really not an easy thing to change. It's an important thing to understand though. The final activity of the entire project was about pulling all of this together and defining my perfect day in 30 days of balance. This has since been redesigned as I've removed more of the limitations from my life and from my thinking but it was a fantastic way to end the project. It allowed me to pull all of the lessons together and develop a tangible idea of who I want to be and how I want to live. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the other subconscious purpose of the Year of Ted construct, which was permission. The ability to give myself permission to make these simple changes and these significant changes in my life. This took me a long time to realise that this is one of the things the project gave me, but I found myself during the project apologising for the fact that I was making all of these changes because they seemed to make people uncomfortable. So I took to referring to my year of TED as my midlife crisis. It wasn't a midlife crisis. It was just that I was finally able to give myself permission to become myself. And now I'd like to talk about my shoes. <laughs> because after 30 days of fashion, this isn't what I look like. This isn't how I dress. There's something altogether different. You see, during the activity, I, found, I worked out that there was a great analogy for the process I was going through, the journey to find my authentic self and to sort of honour that. I may not have been following a yellow brick road, but it's a great way to explain, explain the experience and to explain the lessons from it. 
The artwork is about to shift from my brother's to mine. Let's see if you can tell the difference. <laughs> it was a journey to acquire the wisdom, to understand who I was and what to do with that knowledge. It was a journey of the heart, to acquire the compassion, to support myself and other people. It was a journey of courage, to find out who I truly was and make the changes in my life to honour that. And lastly, it was a journey home, to understand myself and to accept every part of that, good and bad. And yes, I do feel like I battled more than one wicked witch and an army of flying monkeys in the process. But if you remember the story of the Wizard of Oz, the Scarecrow had the best ideas. The Tin Man was compassionate and would often rust himself up with tears. The lion, when put to the test, was extremely brave. And Dorothy? Well, as Glinda explained, she always had the ability to return home with her ruby red slippers. She just had to go through the journey to understand that she had everything she needed all along. And that's what I had to understand through this process. I discovered through this process that I had everything I needed to find out who I was and to make the changes in my life to honour that. It just took me a year-long process to go through and understand it and to trust it. And one of the things that I have realised is that there truly is no place like home. There is nothing as amazing as understanding yourself and being true to the things that make you whole. So if this talk helps you understand you have everything you need to understand yourself, if it encourages some of you or inspires you to start your own self-discovery process, or even if it just helps you realise that you do have the ability to give yourself permission to make the changes you need or want to make in your life, then my work here is done. Because I believe that everyone has the ability to resolve that empty feeling by finding out who they truly are. For many people, that's a private process that may take years to happen. For me, it was through a construct called my year of TED that I found my way home. Thank you. <laughs>